Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 11 of the Firefighters Podcast. Uh, we're very lucky this week uh, to have joining us uh, a friend of mine, firefighter Jeff Cool, who's uh, retired from the FDNY. Jeff, welcome. Thank you for having me, Rob. Yeah, man. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad you uh, found some time for us. Um, our listeners are, are not just firefighters, but we have, uh, you know, just people around the country who are interested in firefighting and kind of like uh, how we operate behind the scenes, you know, interact with our families and stuff. Um, I know you're a big family man, so I thought you'd be great to have on. But uh, let's start out with the job. And uh, when did you get on? I got on uh, July the 5th, 1992. All right. Um, it was uh, the one of the happiest days of my life, you know, uh, probably since, uh, I don't know, 14 to 16, I started, you know, FDNY, you know, I, I read the book report from Edge Company 82 and uh, yeah. first generation FDNY and uh, yeah, and, and it and it had me hook, line and sinker, you know, the job and, uh, you know, I kind of buffed out on it and uh, um I became an Air Force firefighter at 17. Um, oh, wow. uh, I, I knew I couldn't be a New York City firefighter until I was 21. Um, and I read uh, Firehouse Magazine like a lot of young firefighters did back in the day. And uh, I seen this article about uh, the DOD Fire Academy um, with the United States Air Force. And uh, I decided I was going to become an Air Force firefighter first. And I was stationed in Alaska and actually flew down <sighs> in uh 1987 um to take the written test for fdny from alaska and i went back to alaska and uh got out of active duty uh went to work at stewart airport in newburgh um and uh was a firefighter there uh stayed in the air national guard there as a firefighter uh retired there with almost 21 years with uh, with the air guard oh wow and and um ran a traffic control tower every night with uh with another brother uh, with a vest on training for the physical agility test <laughs> you know, back, back when it was a real, you know, the real test, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, so and, now, uh, how did they handle that? Uh, your residency, if you were uh, stationed uh, in Alaska, when you took the test, did it, um, well, did I you was try for those your, points anyway, or what the five points you're talking yeah, about? Or yeah. that, that wasn't, there was none of that back then. You know? Oh no. I mean, there was a, you know, the job back then was merit and merit alone, you know, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, yeah, that's all changed, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you still got veterans credit though, right? Did, when did that start? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't use my, uh, my veterans uh, no. points then. No, I thought I would use it. Oh, you know, you could when, save uh, it. Yeah, yeah. When I took the, uh, a promotional test, you know, but, uh, I had about eight months in the books. I was studying with, uh, with the star fleet, you know, as, as if you will, and, uh, kind of decided I wasn't ready to be a boss yet. And, uh, just was enjoying being a firefighter. And then it's just yeah. pre nine 11. And, um, you know, I, I have no regrets, you know, what I did, you know, my career path was, uh, you know, I don't know if God set me that way or, or what, but, you know, I'm happy, you know, I got to work in two great companies, you know? So. Uh, where'd you work before rescue three? So I got appointed to uh, 19 truck uh, oh, okay. in the South Bronx, and yep. uh, I didn't know 19 truck from 44 truck. Uh, you know, um, I just knew I wanted to be a Bronx fireman. I knew I wanted to be a New York City fireman. Uh, fortunately for myself, I had um, uh, one of my buddies. Uh, he was uh, Chief uh, Joe DiBernardo's aide, Patty Vote. He was in my Air Guard unit, and. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief D became my rabbi before, uh, I even knew Chief D, you know, he got me to 19 truck and, uh, you know, I was, I was blessed to, to work there. You know, I mean, there's so many, uh, so many guys in the job that are leaders uh, today in the job and, you know, past leaders that came through 50 and 19, you know, and yeah. it's just a great, great, great house, you know, um, yeah, um actually never Jimmy, the chance Jim, to work there. Yeah. Jimmy, my Jack that, um, um, you know, it's Jim's gym out at the rock. And yep. Jimmy was one of my, um, one of my instructors when I was in the Academy and, uh, you know, I was blessed to work with him at the end of his career. He came back and retired out at 19, but that's where, uh, Jimmy was a firefighter, you know, and, uh, he was a saint. Um, and he was, uh, an Adonis as, uh, <laughs> you know, as a, as a physical fitness guru. You know? I was going to so, say that would explain all the exercise equipment behind you right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, got a lot of dust on it you know? that's, uh, <laughs> that's that's my son's uh primarily uh my uh 24 year old that's his uh workout equipment 
Unfortunately, I, I can only uh, I can only Peloton now uh, for my injuries. Uh, I can't run anymore, but I play golf and I'm I'm all good with the, all you know right. where I am. You know, so. You know. All right. Well, I guess on that note, um, I know people are going to want to hear about your injuries. Um, something I talk about all the time with myself. Um, if you don't know Jeff, Jeff was front row for several of the biggest tragedies uh, the FDMI has seen in the last twenty or so years, right? Um, but one of them was the Black Sunday fire uh, that I referenced last episode. Um, Jeff worked in Rescue 3 um, that morning. Uh, I remember that day was freezing, right? I, I was working in, uh, in Brooklyn in 108. Um, I remember everything was frozen uh, and we were glued to the radio, essentially listening to what you guys were dealing with. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, can we talk about that job a little bit and Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, there is no true textbook fire, you know, um, Mm -hmm. but this should have been a textbook fire, you know, looking at it, you know, from the outside that day, you know, and you thought you would probably go to this job and be back in quarters in about 45 minutes to an hour. Unfortunately, there was a lot of curveballs that were uh, thrown at us that day. You know, we were facing a nor'easter, wind was blowing in excess of, uh, 40 miles an hour. We had about a foot of uh, snow on the ground. We had frozen hydrants. We had uh, um, the wrong address was initially uh, uh, given to us. Uh, so there was, uh, you know, first due uh, became second due, second due became first due, uh, frozen hydrants, um, you know, you name it. And then uh, uh, illegal SROs on top of that. Uh, the fire was on the third floor. Um, um, there was illegal subdivisions that were made inside these apartments. Um, it's a, it's a problem in the city of New York, but it's not only just in the city of New York. It's uh, in, in more depressed areas. You know, these these slum lords are looking to make a buck, and that's all they're worried about is making a buck and and how many people that they could stick in you know um, one apartment and. Yeah. So they just basically take these apartments and make them smaller and smaller inside. It's illegal. Um, uh, you can't do this. They overload the electricity. They throw up illegal walls. Well, that's what they did that day. They uh, threw up an illegal wall. And padlocks, too. I've, I've noticed a lot of pad, yeah. more padlocks inside the apartment, which you're not yeah, expecting. Padlock, right? Padlocks change. Right. You know, so you, you, you're basically going into a maze anytime as a firefighter. You know that. And uh, But, with, you know, tell the audience, it's a maze. But these mazes become more and more um, complex once you start making these SROs. And so they built this illegal wall um, that didn't run floor to ceiling. So the engine company's in there and, and there was a delay of putting water on the fire uh, because I don't know if ice got in, in the impeller, um, uh, they lost pressure. So the first fuel line um, lost water. So the second fuel line uh, that's on the floor above had to be back down where we were. And we were pressing on looking for life and, you know, they extension of fire. Um, and um, so we were operating up there without a line. Um, so they backed that line back down and uh, they think they're hitting the fire. But basically what they're hitting, um, they're hitting the wall um, and they're just hitting uh, the fires coming over top of like if, if this is the top of the wall, the fire is coming over top of the wall. Right. And, you know, um, we don't see that normally, you know, it's not, a, I mean, that's a, that's a huge curveball. So the fire continued to burn and burn and burn. And, um, uh, I know this because the, uh, the rescue chauffeur was in there and he had the thermal imaging camera and I talked to him after, um, you know, what he's seen that day, you know, um, it's something that we, we have to look at as, uh, as firefighters today. Um, but anyway, you know, we continue to press on, 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 on the fire floor and on the floor above. And we're looking for life and we're looking for fire. And it's it's a a tenable situation that is not, you know, it's not heavy, heavy uh, smoke. You know, it's a moderate smoke condition that basically went to it it went went lights out real quick. Um, You know, uh, we had a report of somebody missing up there um, and we couldn't find them. And there was three apartments on the floor above. There's three apartments on every floor, you know, four stories. now, you'll hear me reference later that it was five stories because there's a below grade entrance in the rear of the building. All right. So in the rear of the building, it's five stories, but it's a four story building. And um, if you don't know, fire, there's a lot of hills in the Bronx out there. So 
if you ever go to Yankee Stadium, you'll notice the buildings around it. They look a lot taller, you know, in the front than they do in the back or vice versa, just because of what Jeff's saying, the hills. So um, that's fine. So we continue, you know, to press on and, um, you know, search for, for life and fire. And uh, I, I'm the rescue. I'm rescue lines that day and I have a thermal imaging camera and I'm with my captain and, you know, he's directing me, you know, where to search for, you know, the walls and, um, and uh, I find a pocket of, uh, of heat in the uh, kitchen area. Um, we open it up right before this. Um, you know, they're asking, you know, about extension on, on the floor above. And, and you hear Lieutenant Curtis Myron um, say that there was slight extension. Seconds later, you hear Captain Chris King, the captain of Rescue 3, transmit, you know, we have heavy fire. We got fire blowing out into the hallway. Um, basically, you know, we found a, a heat source. I opened a wall. Um, fire started to immediately vent out. It wasn't a huge hole. Um, I, I, the, it starts to go lights out, you know? Um, and I step into the hallway a few feet from Captain King and I pan my thermal imaging camera towards the back of the apartment and I pick up silhouettes of firefighters. And, um, I advance towards those guys to tell them that they got to come back towards me to egress, you know, out, out the front door. Sure. And, um, I had a quick face to face with the firefighter that I still don't know who it was. And I told him, I said, we need to fall back. And, uh, you know, we have fire behind us. He goes, we're trapped. And I turn around and floor to ceiling, it was fire. And mm -hmm. we get pushed into this, uh, to this, um, um, room. Um, I think they called it bedroom two. Um, if you look at diagrams and it basically was like rats scurrying in a cage, you know, just going round and around. And mayday after maydays are transmitted. This is the first fire that handy talkie transmissions were ever recorded at. It was mm -hmm. a pilot program. Fortunately, it became a fatal fire. Um, and uh, not all the handy talkie transmissions were picked up. We had problems with our radios prior to 9-11. We had problems with our radios on 9-11. Uh, we had problems with their radios on black sunday um i don't know where the radios are today but i'm just telling you you know where it was that day mm -hmm. um i was trapped with uh lieutenant curtis myron um firefighter eugene stolowski and uh probationary firefighter brendan Cawley of uh, 27 truck in bedroom two um joey d bernardo was rescue hooked that day he was my partner um and he was trapped in bedroom one right adjacent to me so to the left of me we get pushed to windows um you know it's 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 a matter of uh, it's a matter of minutes and guys are jumping out the window um i just want to stop right there real quick so up until mm -hmm. december of 1999 we all had um ropes uh we all had bailout ropes um that we used if we got in an untenable situation and we had they were our personal safety ropes and if we had a bailout, we can quickly and efficiently bail out of the building. Unfortunately, in 1999, the fire commissioner at the time, Tom Van Eysen, decided on his own to take him away from us. Even though that there was documentation that these ropes were used in the past. Um, I have 33 documented cases of where the, the ropes were used in the past. Um, and there was probably more because FDNY, I mean, listen, we're not the greatest record keeping uh, department, <laughs> yeah. at least for my time in a job. We weren't, right. you know, a lot of yeah. stuff went in a circular bed. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they took them away and it, it, it ended up costing firefighters their lives that day. Um, sure. I was the only firefighter carrying a rope that day. Um, I bought that rope uh, six months to the day um, that it was used. I bought it at a trade show. It was firehouse uh, uh, at Baltimore. A um, couple hundred dollars. I remember I came home. My wife seen a credit card receipt. She's like, what is this? I don't know. And I, I'm like, well, it, it's something that may save my life one day. Oh, and, uh, wow. and, it, and it was six months to the day it was used. So get back to 27 truck. So um, Lieutenant Myron, uh, Stolowski and Cawley are to my right. They're pushed up at a window. Um, fire is filling up the room. Um, guys are starting to jump. Um, John Ballou went out a window um, from on the top floor. He was a friend of mine. He was the chauffeur of 27 truck that day. 
Um, you know, again, Mayday after Maydays were transmitted. The, the, the brothers were diligently working, you know, to put fire, uh, the fire out. They're putting, you know, getting water on a fire. They're, su- they're setting up a, a, a life-saving uh, rope evolution on the, uh, on the roof. Um, but when fire is at your back, um, yeah. you know, it, it, it does crazy things. And uh, unfortunately, these guys didn't have ropes. Uh, you can look back to 9-11 and, you know, I mean, I know, you know, in your mind, in my mind, those are etched there forever. You know, guys jump in, guys and girls and uh, fire at your back. You're, you know, you'd rather jump than stay there and burn to death. Yeah. It's just it's uh, it's a crazy thing. And uh, so um, I'll recant some of the stories from that Gene told me. Gene Stolaski is that Lieutenant Myron went first. Um, he was showing the brothers you know, Hey, how to do this, how to lower yourself. Again, it's five stories from where he is, you know, and he held, held on and, uh, out the window he goes and, you know, down to the ground, he was killed that day. Um, did he keep his bottle on? Did they keep their mask Uh, on? Yes. 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 Um, um, next was, uh, Qualley. He was a probie. Uh, his brother, Michael was killed on nine 11 out the window. He went, um, then, uh, Stolowski and, uh, Eugene goes out the window and there's a child guard gate there and he still has his mask on. And I don't physically remember, uh, you know, like it's basically, it's like blinders, you know, like I got a yeah. blinder on to my right side, but it's there. It's still with me is that Gene goes out the window and the alligator clip on the, uh, on the, uh, on the waist strap right. got, uh, got hooked on the child guard gate. And he basically was hanging upside down for a couple of seconds uh, uh, before he, before it let go and right. down to the ground, he went. Um, fortunately, you know, uh, Stolowski and Qualley, they survived that day. Um, John Ballou and, um, and uh, Lieutenant Myron, they were killed. Um, now to the left of me, you know, fire is still filling up the room. I'm on a portable uh, window unit, you know, an air conditioned unit, yeah, right? Five, five stories above the ground, you know, not a, not a place you really want to be hanging out. You know, I mean, um, maybe a screw or a nails hold to me, you know, yeah, in place right now, in a, you know? a window sash or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I look to the left and I, you know, I see Joey and, uh, you know, we have a quick conversation and I said, Joey, I got a rope but I got nowhere to tie it off to. I can't get back in the window. Fire's blown out over my head like a jet, you know, a jet um, engine, you know, Joey right. recanted that to me, you know, and, uh, and uh, I looking at my coat. I mean, I had burns up my back. Uh, I look at your coat, you know, um, hanging behind you with that old uh, um, um, 3M, uh, not 3M, the, I don't even know what that bubble stuff yeah. was, but it used to just run like, you know, like, um, I don't know. It's like plastic when it burns, it just runs, you know? Yep. So that's the way my coat, but it was the newer coat, you know, and it just ran my, uh, my, um, my hand light and my thermal imaging camera, the strap melted into my, uh, into my turnout coat. Oh, shit. That's how high, how high the heat was. Yeah, that's hot. And I said to Joey, I said, I got a rope and nowhere to tie it to Joey says, throw me the rope and a quick argument, you know, um, not being a hero or anything, you know, just doing what we do, you know? And, uh, he says, you got a wife and kids, you go first. And uh, I threw him one end of the rope and he wrapped it around his arm and uh, stood on it um, to have some type of friction. And uh, I took the rope and wrapped it around myself in a belay fashion. So basically just wrapped it around and grabbed my hands to it. Um, now, is he out the window? At, where is he at? exactly at this he's, point? He's in, he's in his He's in window. the room. Oh, he's, yeah, still he's in, in room. bedroom one okay. and I'm in bedroom two. So I'm okay. one, one bedroom over from him. And I, this is speculation, but I believe this is what happened. Um, I came out the window and there was probably a lot of slack in the rope and I pendulum down. So we're, uh, for people that are not firefighters, uh, the front of the building would be exposure one. Looking at it directly from the front to your left would be exposure two, the rear exposure three, and to the right exposure four. So I pendulumed out from the two, three side of the building. And when I came back in, I actually hit the wall right under Joey's window. And I went, I went straight down. 
Now, Joey, well, look, so I landed 10 feet less than where Stalowski, Cawley, um, Myron, and Blue. There's that below grade entrance. Right. Joey takes the same um, the rope. He clips it on a child guard gate. Not a substantial <laughs> object that we know, no. right, Rob? You know, yeah. but it's what he had. Clips it onto that. Goes out the window. Gets down about ten to fifteen feet, and that's approximately what I got down. These are guesstimates. Mm -hmm. And uh, when um, he rolls out the window, at some point, either he loses control of the rope or whatever happens, and down to the ground he goes. But he falls in that below grade entrance. Uh -huh. I was an inch from falling into that below grade entrance. All right. Now we all have catastrophic injuries, you know? Um, but by the grace of God, I still, I mean, uh, I won't get too far ahead of it that, um, that rope and Joey D saved my life that day. There is no if, ands or buts about it. No. Um, and Absolutely. Joey, Joey exemplified everything that brotherhood is that day, you know, what a firefighter is, you know, when he placed my life in front of his, you know, um, John 15, 13 is, uh, you know, the Bible verse is no greater love have one than lay down for his life for his friends. And that's what Joey did that day for me. You know, he became my anchor and uh, I'm forever indebted to to who Joey was, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all in a fight for our lives. You know, we we spent I don't, I don't want to um, eat up your whole program talking about, you know, our injuries. But no, no, um, please. You know, we, um, by rights, all six of us should have been dead that day. Yeah. By, you know, um, it's the grace of God that and you got to be like, what? Hey, I'm here and other guys are not. You know, I um, I broke my back, uh, compression fractures in my back, compression fractures in my neck. I broke all my ribs. Um, I shattered my pelvis. Um, I severed femoral arteries. I bled out 72 units of blood before they had all the bleeding stopped. Now Jesus. the normal the normal human being um, has eight to eight to ten uh, uh, pints of blood in him. You know, and it all varies on height. Right. You know. Um, so, but I bled out over and over again before they had all the bleeding stop. They had to cut me from my from my sternum to my belly button, take all my internal organs and rest them outside my body for X amount of days uh, because of the swelling. It's called uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. Um, I had my lungs collapsed. I, you know, it was, <coughs> it was an absolute mess. Thank God there was a firefighter in squad 41 that day. That was a former paramedic. He started the, um, um, the, the critical care in the back uh, that day, along with the other brothers, but he was, he was the main guy, you know, that was, sure. that was setting it up. And then, you know, EMS got back there. Let me tell you what, EMS did a tremendous job. The brothers did a tremendous job, you know, with everything, you know. I mean, I, um, you know, there was a firefighter. Actually, he's not a firefighter. He's a lieutenant, 56 truck, uh, Lieutenant White. And uh, he was standing back there. And if you listen to the radio transmissions, you know, he's given, you know, um, you know, he's given the incident commander, you know, uh, the play-by-play -play back there. And, you know, and he sees, and you know, he's like, one, two, three four, five, six guys to jump from the rear of the building. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, I, 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 talk, I, I talk to Lieutenant White, and I would say that I'd rather be back in that window than be where you were that yeah. day, you know, standing there watching helplessly, you know, like there was yeah. nothing he could do. I mean, you know, like for people that don't understand, you know, our tactics and FDNY, we're aggressive interior firefighters. Um, you know, we, we go where – you know, where other people wouldn't dare go, you know, I mean, we're not looking to get killed. Did I ever think that I was going to die or get seriously injured in the line of duty? There's always a good chance, you know? Um, but unfortunately, you know, this, this building, you know, like you were talking about the Hills and stuff, we couldn't get um, an aerial to the rear of the building. There was no access for an aerial and our, our, uh, our tallest um, uh, portable ladder is 35 feet. So it was no good back there, you know, right. to, and, and they were setting up the life serving, life saving rope evolution. And, uh, it takes some time to set up. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, um, guys already jumped before, uh, it was in play and, um, you know, you had six guys to, to take out of there. Now, if we all had ropes that day, it, it could have been a different story. Now, would guys get hurt that day? 
yeah, there's a good chance guys are going to get hurt. You know, they're going to get burned. They, you know, they could have been a broken bone. But, I mean, I firmly believe that, you know, guys would have been alive. And it, it was uh, one of the biggest mis mistakes that um, um, the fire department ever made. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, they saved right. like $800,000, $800, you know, by not, you know, there was a shelf life on these ropes. Right. You know, the story, I I'll tell the story because a lot of people don't want to tell the story is that, you know, there was a shelf life on these ropes. And, hey, let's save $800,000. You know, guys are not allegedly not carrying them. They're not using them. And, uh, you know, it killed guys. So you think about $800,000. I don't know what you, a dollar value that you put on your life. I don't know the dollar value of my life. You know, like you got to talk to your family. Like what, what, what is that dollar that's going to replace? You know, well, I, I know the value that the United States government put on my life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> isn't it great? Isn't it great, Rob? I yeah. know we, you and I, we get left about these things. We know them now, but it's like, this is my sarcasm to, uh, cause do you want to go knock on a door, you know, um, as, a as the mayor, chief of department, the commissioner, uh, whoever we failed to provide, you know, to these guys that day, but he was a great firefighter or she was a great firefighter, you know, um, to me, you know, we wear thousands and thousands of dollars in PPE on our backs to go in and save lives and property. Right. But if we can't bail out, if the situation arises and save ourselves, yeah, and really, I mean, really, what is it? Because it's a couple hundred dollars, you know, and, after and ultimately eight hundred k that they probably paid more more than that out in pensions oh, for I'm, the guys who died, right? So um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure. You know, that, that that's neither here nor there, but that it's also yeah. just shows the short sightedness of, of that decision. Yeah. And they spent $16.5 million to develop the, uh, the personal safety system that FDNY wears today, right. you know? Um, and you know, the, the dollar that there is no dollar value that's ever going to bring back my, my friends, you know, it's never right. going to put me back, you know, in the firehouse, you know, um, um, and it's unfortunate, you know? So I, I just want to talk, you know, like, I, I mean, I had catastrophic injuries, you know, and, um, it was bad. You know, it was, it was real bad. It was touch and go for a long time. Um, you know, I, I talked to my friends that, that sat there with me, you know, uh, Timmy Wren, it's one of the senior guys and, and rescue three. Sorry. Um, Sorry. he was, he was there from uh, minute one, you know, with my, uh, with my family, you know, and he became the liaison for, uh, for me, you know, for the cool family but he was there every day. And, you know, he got my wife to the hospital and, you know, when my wife got to the hospital, when she got to, uh, um, uh, St. Barnabas in the Bronx, um, you know, the doctor started telling her, you know, what was going on. And, uh, she seen me briefly and she said, my, my head was like this big, you know, and it was just swollen and it didn't look like me. And, you know, my, my kids were real young, you know, at the time, real, yeah, real young. And, uh, you know, we're coming up on the 17 year anniversary of this and, uh, her words to the to the doctor was put them back together any way you can and I'll take them, you know, and uh, and she meant it, you know, and uh, I was blessed to, you know, to have the support of her, um, you know, my uh, my brothers, you know, being there every day, my my family, you know, and. Uh, you know, and that, and that helped me through through my whole ordeal, you know, I mean, I spent 30, I think it was 38 days in the ICU in St. Barnabas and then I was three and a half months inpatient at Helen Hayes hospital. Um, and then over a year outpatient, you know, learning to walk, walk, um, you know, function again, you know, I was probably, yeah. I was probably about two or five to 10, uh, at the time, you know, in pretty good shape, you know, playing hockey all the time, just started training for the New York city marathon, um, that I was going to run in 2005. And, uh, you know, it all, it all came, it all came crashing down, you know, and uh, I, I probably weighed when I first got on a scale, uh, weighing myself, I was like 150, 155. That's how much weight I, I lost. I was like, you know, I was, I was emaciated, you know, but I was, I was fighting from, from as soon as I was conscious, I was fighting for the brothers to make sure that they, uh, they got the ropes, you know, um, that yeah. nobody faced what we faced. Uh, I have a video of me and, uh, commissioner safe for a talk. And, and, you know, I played, I told him that was the scariest day of my life. You know, I, you know, make sure that, that that doesn't happen to, uh, you know, to firefighters ever again, you know, and now, you know, we're blessed that 
those systems are out there now. And, um, you know, unfortunately they're there, you know, over a tragedy, you know, I mean, they're stamped on them, you know, one, two, three, you know, to, to, uh, to signify that day. And, um, I just, uh, I just hope that the brothers wear them and then they continue to train on them because, um, you know, just having one's not going to save your life, you know? Right. And, yeah. No, no. And, uh, you know, so, uh, through the whole ordeal, it, w- it was tough. It was real tough for me. I gave my wife, uh, <laughs> let me tell you what, I was, I was an SOB man, you know? Yeah. Um, I, um, I was mad at the world, you know? Um, and, uh, it took me a long time, you know, uh, through my wife continue, go to counseling, go to counseling. You know, we have the, uh, CSU, you know, um, they come and talk to you. I remember one day I was in such a bad mood, man. Um, you know, I'm on the phone dealing with, um, the powers to be, you know, and federal government, you know, mm-hmm. you know, dealing with my social security and, you know, my benefits and stuff. And, and the guy's like, the guy's like basically, you know, put me through the ringer, you know? And yeah. uh, I'm like, I, I'm like, I fell 40 feet, you know? And he's like, yeah, well, people recover from this. Well, I hit the con- I hit concrete at about 35 miles an hour. And I go, you know, I had guys die to the left and right of me, you know? And he's like, so? You know, that was his answer to me. Right. I was so beside myself that day. I don't even like, I, I just seen red. I mean, I just totally seen red. And um, I don't know. I don't know who I talked to that got somebody there that day. But I'll tell you, uh, John Bruckner, uh, he's a retired battalion chief and uh, a great guy. Basically, probably came and saved my life that day because it was it was that bad, you know, um, you know, and, and got me got me back to seeing straight that day, you know, and then, uh, you know, I, I went on to counseling, you know, a long time. And uh, I, I'm a conservative, you know, and uh, that's 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 my view in life, you know, and I'm a patriot and a conservative. And my counselor that I that I dealt with, um, uh, Steve, Dr. Steve, you know, he uh he uh, he seen stuff from a different light, but we learned to uh, agree to disagree. And mm-hmm. let me tell you what, that guy helped me so much to get my my head on straight and get me pushed in the right direction. And um, that also happened by getting sick again um, and having um, I don't know if it was non eleven issues or um, just issues from you know my fall. But God came into my life and uh, and and really steered me and uh, and and that was it and you know and then I uh, I would say for the most part I don't have my wife here right with me right <laughs> now but you know like how my life is today um, I'm, I'm much better than where I was you know I mean I was just I was just angry all the time I lost a lot of years in my life you know just being angry you know and yeah uh, I, I I agree uh, I can relate to that I should say. Um... I, I feel like I've wasted years of my life being angry over shit that was never going to change anyway. So whether or not I chose to be angry, it was only hurting me, right? It yep. wasn't going to change what happened. It wasn't going to change what's happening. So, yep. you know, I, I always say that to my wife, uh, anger is a choice um, that we make far too often. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, again, hindsight's twenty twenty, and right. you could tell your story and I could tell my story and, and hopefully, you know, we help, you know, guys that are battling the demons, you know, cause, uh, it, it, it sucks and, and you're not going through it alone. You know, guys don't see that, you know, every now and then I'll have somebody hit me up and, you know, and I, I actually, I just texted a guy this morning. He's a, he's a war vet, you know, and he's a firefighter. And, uh, I just, you know, he's talking about sleep and, and stuff. And, uh, and I see, so you just got to keep trying, you know, it's like, because I, I'm still trying stuff today. I'm, I'm actually, I just started a new regiment, um, a couple of weeks ago, I'm taking, supplements i'm doing testosterone and you know i'm going to be double nickels here in january mm-hmm. and uh, i was thir- i just turned 37 when this when you know when my life changed and uh and you know like uh, uh again i'm a veteran and i look up to a lot of veterans and I'm, and I'm i've learned this one thing you know this this program that i'm trying now to help me get REM sleep because my sleep is horrible from mm-hmm. ptsd and from survivor's guilt it's just horrible and that you know, there's a lot of us that, that go through it. You know, you're not the only one, you know, Jeff, you're not the only one, Rob, you're not the only one, you know, right. it's like, you know, but you just got to keep trying. You just can't quit. You know, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm definitely in that philosophy in my life, you know, uh, today is just never quit. You know, I mean, t- you know, you could have a bad moment, 
You can have a bad hour. You can have a bad day. You can have a bad week. You can have a bad month. You can have a bad year, but there's life, you know? And yeah. You know, so. And I, I think it's important that you share your story and you tell people because like you said, somebody was there for you. Right. And sa- yeah. saved you when you were, when you were down. Um, I've told my story before about how Ray Pfeiffer was there for me. Um, and it shows that usually it comes from people who understand and who are down there and, and can tell you from their experience that, you know, it's worth, it's worth fighting for, you know, life is worth fighting for. Um, you know, when you have someone who's dying, like Ray was kicking you in the ass and telling you to keep living, you know, it, it resonates a little more than, you know, watching an episode of Dr. Phil or something, you know? (laughs) Yeah. You know so I, mean? I, I, I've only had, um, you know, I was blessed to have a brief encounter with Ray and we were at, uh, we were in Nashville and, um, we were there with the Joey D foundation and, uh, and, and Ray was just full of life. And, you know, meanwhile, he's, he's dialing, you know, for his life and he was just full of life. Just, uh, just, you know, you, just to, uh, to feel that, oh my God, it was just incredible. You know, it's, uh, it was good stuff. Yeah. yeah, he 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 had that that quality about him that you could feel it. You could feel his, uh, like you said, his his exuberance for life. Like it was contagious. You yeah. know, even though you'd say, "Ray, how you feeling?" And he'd say, "I'm I'm dying," or "I got cancer." How you think I? But yet he'd say it with a smile that would make you laugh and make you yeah, make yeah. you feel better for him being sick. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, that's yeah. the quality that you know. I, I wish more people had, but that's what makes yeah. him him. Yep. Um, you, you you talked about the Joe D Foundation. Um, can we talk a little about Joe and just you know? I think I think there's a. I think what gets lost uh, to the public, not to us, because we we know uh, what guys go through um, after shit like this, but to the public, you know, and like you said, to the pencil pushers, it's kind of like you know, out of sight, out of mind, get over it or whatever. But Joe, Joe, uh, he dealt with a lot of physical pain, right? Um, yeah sometimes well, just i like you yeah so let's let's say who joey was before right. you know like you know so joey since he was a little kid you know like whoever you had hanging on your wall you know we're hockey guys you know you know so maybe you had uh you know you had uh espo hanging on the wall or whoever you know looking at you know that you looked up to back in the day i'm or, a little younger than you so i i had right. messier and gretzky all right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so you're calling me old right <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, um, Joey had Tom Kennedy, um, you know, hanging up on his wall. Tom Kennedy was a deputy chief in the Bronx, but he was, uh, you know, he was a tough fireman back in, you know, he was a tough fireman his whole career, but he was an 82 and 31 fireman. And uh, he had uh, uh, a picture or a poster. I don't know what it was from, but that was his idol, you know, like. He didn't have like, you know, a girly poster up there he was looking at or a rock poster or, or whatever. You know, he was always wanted to be a firefighter. And his dad says that he put his first fire out when he was like, I don't know, 12 years old or whatever. You know, he's riding with his dad, you know, um, going into the, you know, to uh, wherever he was at the time. I think it was Brooklyn at the time. But uh, anyway, um, he was. Oh, he was an encyclopedia of knowledge. I mean, the guy wasn't just like, he just didn't know, like read books and know like all the facts and, you know, uh, how to rig something up or how to do a shoring uh, uh, job. You know, I mean, the guy could just do it. He would, he, he would, he wanted to drill all the time. He wanted to figure out how to make something better. Um, he, there's no doubt in my mind, he would have been a deputy chief, just like his old man, you know, if not the chief of department one day, you know, and uh, the guy just lived and breathed the job, you know, um, often we say, you know, we hear brothers say, Hey, I'm on a job, you know, and one of Joey's sayings were, are you on a job? Are you into the job? You know, he was like, I mean, like everybody wants to have their couch time, but Joey, Joey was all that guy, you know, the guy that motivated you all the time. Hey, let's go drill. Let's go drill, you know? And, Joey had less time than me on a job, but he, he was in special operations command a lot longer. He went to special ops when they formed the squats. Quick story on that is uh, his dad asked me to go to the squads um, when they were formed at, shortly after the initial batch went in, right? right. Chief D's at roll call one day at 1519. And uh, he goes, 
hey, Jeff, can I talk to you? Absolutely, Chief. You can talk to me. You know, he's like, hey, listen, Joey's up in squad 61. He went to X amount of jobs the other day, forced X amount of doors, blah, blah, blah. You know, he goes, so what do you think? You want to go to squad? And I'm like, my answer to Chief was, I'll think about it. In the back of my mind is I'm like, and one of the busiest truck companies in, in the New York City Fire Department, you know, I mean, we're doing fire duty, you know, right. OSW, you know, occupied structural work. It's not just, you know, and it was a cast of characters that I worked with that I just loved, you know. Yeah. And uh, speed forward, 9-11 happens. Um, I lost 33 friends on 9-11. Um, we lost 97 guys in Special Operations Command that day. And uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to throw, you know, the job was looking for senior guys to step up to the plate. And with a heavy heart, I did that. You know, I lost a personal friend in Rescue 3, Tommy Foley, mm -hmm. and I threw my hat in, in the ring. And uh, I think it was October the 5th of 01, I'm in, I'm in Rescue 3, um, the first batch of guys that comes over. It was myself, uh, Pat McKenna from 45 Truck, and Steve Nassau from 33 Truck. And uh, we're the first first bunch of guys to go there. And uh, I, I wish it was under different circumstances, you know, because yeah. um, you know the stories of all the guys that, that were lost that day. There was eight guys from rescue three. And, uh, but I, I did what I did and I'm, I'm proud to say that I went there and to help rebuild, um, the company, the command, the job. Um, now we'll get back to Joey is that Joey, you know, he, he was one of those guys that was getting me up to speed. He was out teaching at rescue school. He was like still a new guy and, and the command and he's teaching out at rescue school because he knew everything, you know, he right. lived, breathe, ate, slept the job, you know, that was, that was this whole thing, the job, the job, the job, you know, and how to make the job better. And, uh, so Joey, you know, Joey had a lot of similar injuries to myself, a lot of similar injuries. The different injuries that he had is that he landed on his feet when he fell. I landed on, I believe my left side and okay. my thermal imaging camera was under me and it took, it, it blew apart. You know, it was the old, uh, MSA, I think 4,000. It was like, it was like the, uh, well, again, I'm older than you, Rob, but you probably had a bigger <laughs> TV in your room. I had that nine inch black and white, you know, no, I had that too. Don't worry. Yeah. I'm the but youngest. What, I'm the youngest. Yeah. I got the last TV in the house. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, Joey fell on his feet and, um, broke his pelvis, broke all the bones in his feet and he was dealing with pain all the time yeah. and he missed the job. And like myself, I was on pain medicine. I was, I was on fentanyl. I was on oxy, oxycodone. I was on, um, Ambien's or whatever else. And, you know, all, all this medicine and my brother worked in pharmaceuticals and my brother's like, as soon as you can get off the meds, as mm -hmm. soon as you can. Now I was on fentanyl before fentanyl like exploded. And we didn't, right. you know, we see all these people being addicted to fentanyl and, um, Anyway, I started exploring uh, acupuncture, uh, Reiki or Reiki, however you say that, you right. know, and uh, um, it helped me tremendously. Like I seen an old Chinese doctor and, you know, I'm talking to Dr. Kelly, the chief medical officer doing his stuff. And she gave me her blessing to do it, you know, yeah. and it helped. I mean, the pain's still there. I mean, it's like a, taking a pill. Um, it masks the pain. It never takes the pain totally that's, away. That's you know? exactly how I feel. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I was doing some crazy shit with it too. I mean, I was like, you know, cause you wanted to sleep and, uh, mm -hmm. and I, and I've talked about this in the past. I'm not ashamed. It's stupid what I did, you know, taking all these meds, uh, with, um, you know, sleep and pill and then washing it down with a Heineken right. because I wanted yeah. to sleep, you know, yeah. because I wanted to sleep. I wasn't looking to harm myself, Yeah. you know, but that's me. That's, that's, that's my story from that day. And I, you know what? I, uh, I, I don't take any pain medicine today. Um, not, not at the current moment, but we'll talk about that in, in, <laughs> in right. later on. Um, so getting back to Joey, Joey had all these injuries and Joey's dealing with uh, physical and mental pain. And not every conversation Joey and I had was a pleasant conversation. Um, sometimes we'd scream at each other on the phone and hang up, you know, Yeah. but I loved him. I, I still love Joey. I miss him every day. Um, he missed the job. He missed the job and he knew he was never going back into the firehouse. Should he have stayed on a job and went and taught somewhere? 
I don't know. Again, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, Joey Joey could do all that, but he's never going to be able to fight fires again. You know, mm-hmm. like myself, I was offered a job to teach at rescue school, but I'm never going in another fire. You know, right. and uh, so he 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 missed the job tremendously. You know, it was everything to him, and um, I guess part of this is speculation. You know, um, um. Part of it's just being um, gaining knowledge uh, from my um, life and from others' lives is that doctors, when they when they listen to us, the guys have been through stuff like us, is that when when they're listening, sometimes they're like this. Uh, they're they're looking. They're not looking at you. They're down just writing another script and they're writing another script, mm-hmm. and they're not really listening. You know, diagnosing. Like a car mechanic, like a good car mechanic. Hey, you hear that yeah. tick, tick, tick? You know, it's like, right, right. and uh, so anyway, you know, Joey's on all these medicine and um, um, he went into respiratory distress um, from from the medicine. Actually, I read this book. It's, uh, this guy was a Marsec uh, Raider, uh, Marine, special operations guy, Nick. Mark Marcalis, a Greek name, you know, I, I, it was just a great, great read. Um, and he talks about the VA and how he was treated and how they just kept giving him medicine and giving him medicine. And it's still not taking, you know, his pain away, you know, mm-hmm. making him better. And, uh, the one day his heart just starts racing and his, and his wife, uh, his, I'm sorry, his wife, his girlfriend, um, starts, um, uh, giving him copious amounts of water to flush his system because his heart was just racing. And I don't know if that's, you know, really what happened with Joey, like if that could have helped, you know? Um, But I do believe that, you know, medicine is abused today, you know, and Mm -hmm. I'm not saying by Joey, by our doctors that they don't take the time to listen. I actually walked out of a pulmonologist's office one day because I'm explaining my, my injuries to him. And a guy said to me, and I was sick. I had pneumonia at the time. And this is after, after it, you know, so it's after Black Sunday. It's after 9-11. And, uh, and I'm giving him answers. And he's like, I don't have five minutes for every question I answer, you know, ask you. And I'm like, right. oh, you don't? You know, so I basically told him, you know, F off and out the door I went, you know. And right. uh, I just, I, I can't do that, you know. And I, it, it, the system is broke. You know, I mean, our medical system is broke, Uh you know, and um, sometimes we got to police our own, you know, whether, you know, when I say police our own, you know, we're firefighters, but you know what? We have brothers in blue. We could help those guys out. We could help our our veterans out too, you know, because we walk, we walk that same road, you know, and, you know, we could help each other out with it. And uh, so we lost Joey, we lost Joey November 22nd, 2011. So it's been the, we just, it's, it's 10 years now. And, um, I just was at his grave. We just, uh, my, my son and I, he's 24. He's an FBMI EMS Academy right now with this, with his sights on, you know, being a firefighter for the city of New York. And, you know, both my boys, um, Dylan and, and Jeff, they're, uh, you know, Joey is uncle Joey to, to my boys, you know, and, uh, they, they look up to him and, you know, who he, who he was, and, you know, what he did and what he stood for. So, um, time after Joey passed, um, Mike Dugan and John Salka came up with an idea. Um, Joey taught with these guys on the outside, firefighter safety and survival. And they said, Hey, why, why don't you guys start a, a, a training seminar or why don't you do a training seminar in Joey's name? And it took legs and we started a foundation um, or gained legs uh, in Joey's name, the Lieutenant Joseph P. D. Bernardo Memorial Foundation. And uh, we provide grants to fire departments across North America that can't afford to bail out systems. Um, We just ran our, uh, I don't even know how many seminars we've run, but our most successful one um, just about a month and a half ago out at the Suffolk County Fire Academy. It was two days of hands-on and one day of lecture. So it was a three-day seminar. We had 300 and some odd students that went through it. Uh, we had firefighters as far away as uh, Hawaii come, um, as, far north as, as far north as Canada. Um, you know, I mean, we, it, it's, just, it's just great, great things that we're doing. Um, 
we are a true uh, 501c3. You know, there's a lot of 501c3s out there, but there is uh, there's nobody on payroll at the time. Yeah. Um, and, that was uh, our first rule when we started the Ray Pfeiffer Foundation was that nobody would ever get paid. It's the first yeah. rule we agreed to. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I mean, there's, there's nothing better than, you know, to, you know, the feeling that giving, you know, that giving yeah. part, you know, it's just, uh, and, um, you know, we, we have a group of uh, individuals that, you know, including our accountant, our, our, uh, uh, our lawyer, that they do it pro bono. And we're blessed that we, you know, we get to do that, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I think we've given out, um, you know, Chief E would give you the exact numbers, but I think it's like 800,000 some dollars in grants out the fire departments across North that's, America. That's ironic. Uh, why, why is it ironic? Cause you were saying it was $800,000 savings to the city when they cut it. Yeah, I know? guess. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. That's and, awesome. Uh, Wow, you make the hair stand up on the back of my neck, man. Right? That. It's like it's. Uh, um, but I think I think, you know, uh, as Herb Brooks famously said, uh, "Great moments are born from great opportunity." Right? Uh, un the unfortunate opportunity is that Joe's no longer with us, but now you have the opportunity to repay him for saving your life by saving other people's lives. You know. Um, I have no doubt that at, at least at this point, one person's life has been saved by uh, those systems you gave out. I mean, they, they, as you said, they probably get used way more often than we know they do. I could name like five instances that I know of that guys used it and didn't fucking tell anyone. Yeah. A lot of times it's embarrassment or you just don't want to deal with the paperwork or whatever it is, you know? Um, so I, I think that that's, that's a beautiful thing what you're doing. Um and I, I, that's exactly why I do what I do uh, with the Ray Pfeiffer Foundation, because it's, like I said, he was there for me in that darkest day of my life, you know, where I, I, I thought about giving up. Uh, so to give people that feeling of, you know, you get a $20,000 medical bill and you don't know how you're going to pay for it. And then we come in and we're like, you don't have to worry about it. You know, Ray's paying for it. It's a great feeling. Um, and I think it's a good, and I think that, support gives people like you were saying, when you were in the hospital, you knew your brothers were in the hallway having your back with your family, just having that in your mind, I think gives you that little bit extra fight that you might need, you know, just knowing that people are there on your side, you know, I think that that goes a long way too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, listen, God, uh, God knows our path, you know, from the day we're born, you know, we don't, you know, and, uh, Sometimes we question it, you know, like, hey, you know, why, why, why me? You know, I mean, I know I've done that, you know, but uh, I, I, at this moment in my life, I feel truly blessed to be where I am, you know, um, and to be able to do what I do, you know. Um, uh, I'm, I'm definitely in a, a pay it forward person, you know. I do a lot of stuff. The Joey D Foundation. I work with uh, two other foundations that I'm, you know, anytime I'm asked to do something, I'm right there with it. Um, uh, a buddy of ours, uh, Johnny Walters, uh, retired out of rescue one. Um, mm. he lost his leg in 2006. He introduced me to, uh, to, uh, a buddy and his name's Ryan Parrott. And he was a Navy SEAL, uh, when nine 11 happened. And, uh, he, uh, he got blown up over in Iraq and, uh, he, his grandfather was a Detroit firefighter. And, uh, it's just, it's weird how your paths cross, yeah. you know, and, he gets blown up in Iraq and uh, he sees that burn medicine is not evolving because um, his buddies took the brunt of it there. And then he starts a non for profit called Sons of the Flag. And, uh, and um, you know, it's evolving burn technology, burn medicine. And, you know, not only for our veterans, but for our first responders and civilian and getting uh, our, our military doctors and our civilian doctors to work together in a joint fellowship. And uh, it's just good stuff. And uh, then he then he started another foundation called the Bird's Eye View Project, and it's extreme sports uh, to raise funds uh, and awareness for our veterans and first responders. Oh, um, cool. I, I've taken part in two of those uh, extreme sports things. So in uh, in you know going back to January twenty third two thousand five, uh, we'll joke for a second. Sick fire humor is that uh, you know I jumped without a parachute that day. Um, I'm here uh, about five years ago. Uh, I jumped at about, uh, I think it was 12,000 feet. Oh, wow. Uh, never, 
Never thought I was going to jump out of an airplane. Um, we raised a half a million dollars that day um, for uh, a bunch of veteran and first responder uh, charities. Actually, I jumped with Mike Dugan um, uh, and Bobby Halton, the, uh, um, the editor-in-chief of uh, Fire Engineering. Yeah. And I, I think when Dugan went, uh, now Mike says this, I think we were at 12, right? When he jumped, it went up to 14. You know, the plane just lifted, you know, when he went out. <laughs> and then uh, and just uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, I was back in Texas in this place called Ennis, Texas. I had a different name for that place because uh, it was more like Anus, Texas, you know, that was just mm. like desolate, you know. But uh, anyway, we did a tactical combat course and uh, it was 20 stations and uh, – um, hanging out with a bunch of uh, former special operators, you know, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, Green Berets, shooting a lot of guns, uh, doing crazy stuff, flying in helicopters, shooting out of helicopters. And uh, we raised $325,000 that day. Um, and uh, awesome. the, the benefactor of both those events that you know uh, well one of the benefactors was the joey d foundation so i feel good about that being able to do still do stuff you know yeah. um you know mm -hmm. and uh you no know, it is it is you know what it is with life you know so, yeah I, that that that's how i feel i, I was i felt like you know, I'm, I'm not religious like you are um and, well, and I, 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 i'm let's just put it i'm not a perfect person to begin with you know so. right right I, i'm just saying saying my belief system uh you know i i but i don't I, I try not to to feel you know why me or i i don't take life personally you know uh i think that's that's the only way life beats you is if you feel sorry for yourself and you, you take it personally because shit happens to everyone right we all yeah. got have to deal with with our own stuff but um you know i i just I find it like, I don't know if you know this, like, cause we don't, we, we, we know each other fairly well now, but we, we had barely met. And when I was going through my toughest time, um, you would send me messages randomly, like checking in on me. Uh, and that always meant a lot to me because like, A, you didn't really know me, but B, like you knew what I was going through, um, specifically with the neck injuries and the, you know, the spinal injuries and the pain, um, so I, always, I don't know, like, I don't know, I guess there's something to that. Right. Um, and it was the same with Ray. Like it, for some reason, when I would get a message from you or Ray, like I just, it affected me more because it felt like it, it wasn't like a, Hey, how you doing? You know what I mean? Like, cause yeah. I don't know. So well, that's because, know. because you're a member of the misfit toy club. Okay? Oh. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, it's, Ray was a member of the Misfit Toy Club. You know, there's a lot of members of the Misfit Toy Club, you know, and uh, Johnny Walters actually uh, came up with this one day. We were out on, uh, we we're out on Marine One. And, um, and this is when our, our buddy was in town, the uh, Ryan Parrott. And uh, we're showing him, you know, the city and the job. And uh, it's, uh, it's Mike Shunk, uh, Johnny Walters, both that got hit by the taxi cab uh, from, from Rescue One in 2006. Right. Rob Weedman. They, uh, from rescue two that got burned up in the, in, yep. in the brownstone know, Rob, yep. and, and, and myself, and we're getting a picture of Marine one, you know, and, uh, and Johnny, uh, Johnny's like the misfit toy club. I go, you know, we could have four or five in there with us too, you know, just with the rescues, but there's a ton of guys, you know, they're in the misfit toy club, Gene Stolaski, misfit toy club, you know, Brandon Qualley, misfit toy club, you know, yeah. it's like, um, you know what? And we, we carry that, you know, we joke about it, but we carry that badge with, with an honor that because we can help out other brothers and sisters that are going through the battle that, that we faced. And that sometimes that it still rears its head, you know? Yeah. I think, yeah, I don't want to make you angry, but I have a story. It was, I was working today, Joey passed away or, or, or like the next day when the article came out in the newspaper. And I was working in a different squad company and guy was reading the paper and he made some very off color remarks about the story. And, uh, you know, I just pushed my, I was eating breakfast. I just pushed my, di my dish in the middle of the table and I got out and walked away and, and he was like chirping at me as I'm leaving. And he said something like, I'd give my left nut to get three quarters. And I just turned around and looked at him like, you would trade for that? 
Like how, that's what you got out of reading that fucking article. You know what I mean? And I think that my initial point was like, people just look at it like you're just retired. But when you're dealing with a, you can't go to the job you love anymore. Like we all love going to work. People don't understand that. And B, you're, you're dealing with immense amount of physical pain and emotional trauma of, of everything. I mean, I'm sure Joey witnessed other trauma besides just that day that he was dealing with also, you know, like we all are, you know, 9-11, plane crashes, 9/11 you know? <laughs> right? Even just, a t- you know, you could just, like I had my friend Joe on who, who had to do CPR on a two-year-old baby hit by a drunk driver. Like th- that stuff never goes away, yeah. you know? And, and to think like, that that the money or whatever is is that's just going to make you okay like so i think there's a lot that goes into retiring for us like it's not just it's not just not being able to do your job it, it's, no. it's the pain and the guilt and the and the whatever which is why well, i do what i do because it gave me the chance to to finish my 20 years you know I, I i look at my time with the ray Pfeiffer foundation as an extension of of the work i did you know and the work in washington is an extension of i can't go to a fire well this is what i'm going to do no, you know, absolutely. It's good stuff. But, you know, getting back to that guy, you know, that I'm not going to dwell on it all day, but he's not the first guy that ever said, you know, that, you know, you know, that, you know, there's a lot of people out there um, that are convinced that Joey committed suicide, you right. know, and Joey did not commit suicide. Let me tell you what, Joe, so I didn't tell the whole story before, you know, Joey and I, you know, we, we had our moments. I love Joey, right? We had our moments. But then all of a sudden, Joey just got into the, he was in a groove, bro. He was in a groove and he finally found happiness. Mm-hmm. And this is right before he passed. He was in, he was happy. He was writing poetry. I'm like, who the hell <laughs> is this guy? You know, it's like, I'm like, there's no way that Joey's writing poetry. Right. You know, and he's like, life's good. Life's good. And I still remember that day, Timmy Wren came to my house and he pulled in a driveway and I thought it was my brother. So I seen a pickup truck and I was in a kitchen and I was putting stools together and I hear somebody walking on a deck and I'm like, all right, my brother's coming in the back door and, uh, and it's Timmy. And I open the door. I'm like, what's up? And he just looks at me and he said, Joey's dead. And, uh, I couldn't even cry. I was just like in, I was in like total shock and disbelief yeah. because everything was good in his life, you know, and, and he was gone. And, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll say one, you know, like, I don't know if this guy is going to listen to this show, but he's a coward, you know, he's a coward to say that he's, he's a, he's a coward to say that three yeah. quarters. Let me tell you what, I fucking miss that job every day, uh-huh. you know? I don't go into the firehouse a lot because when you walk by that rig, you know, that's not any rig. There's five of them in the city, right? There's five, Mm -hmm. five rescues in the city of New York. And that was my horse. You know, that was my stallion that I got up on. I'm never getting on it again. You know, and and this guy, you know, this wasn't the job to me was not just a job. It was a calling, something I wanted to do forever, you know? And, you know, to see a guy say something like that, three quarters, let me tell you what, man, that's, uh, uh, those guys just irk me. They, they irk me. You know, it's like that patch that you wear on your sleeve, it's an honor to wear that, right? Mm-hmm. You should hold that as high as the flag of the United States of America, right? Or just below it, you know, because it's an honor to wear either one of those, you know, on your sleeve, you know? Absolutely. And it lived and in, in, in breathed in, inside of me as it did Joey did, you know, and and to know that that guy was, you know, you're telling me like you kind of gave me some information. He's in a squad. Well, I thought he was a douchebag before he made that <laughs> statement anyway. So it, it really I, did, did I it change my opinion of him. I concur. I concur. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, did, I never liked the guy anyway, but that that was it. That was I think that was probably the last time I ever spoke to the guy. Um, I, I got Did out. You see him on the order. Maybe we. I, I don't. I don't. I don't look at the orders. I don't know. <laughs> but I, you know, I and you don't like I. I got on the job under different circumstances than you. Like I, I, I technically I'm third generation, but I didn't dream of doing it. I didn't, you know, like I just kind of stumbled into it. I, my brother made me take the test. I graduated college and got called. Like it was just, yeah. it was life. 
But once I put the uniform on, like that was it. Like it it doesn't matter how you get there, but once you're fucking doing it, you got to take pride in it because at any minute you could be hanging out that window. So how could you do a job like that and not, and not be all in? I like, I don't understand guys like that. And, and if you're looking to make money, there are plenty of fucking things you could do in the world to make more money than oh, absolutely. lighting if you fires did, and going on EMS yeah. runs at three o'clock in yeah. the morning. It's not it's not a job to become rich in, that's for right. sure. You know, that's you know? What I never it's rich in that. a rich in a lot of other ways, but not, you know, not for the money, you know. You know? Right, right. Yeah. It, it's it's about yeah. you know, being able to look yourself in the mirror and and yeah. and the friendships you forge. You can't forge those type of friendships somewhere else. It's like uh like a hockey locker room, you know, you're not going to, yeah, yeah. you know, you know yeah. what I mean? Let's, let's talk about a hockey locker room. Yeah. Story. I don't know if you were there that day. Were you, were you at the hospital? Like the day they came into Helen Hayes, the team? Uh, I don't think so. All right. Well, so, you know, I know, well, I knew so many guys that played on a team, you know, I was in the same caliber to play on, you know, on, on the, on the team, you know, but I played in the Bronx Harlem league, you know, and, I knew so many of the guys that played on the team, you know, and uh, um, some of them are out of the picture now, you know, most of them are just alum, you know, but right. uh, so I'm in Helen Hayes at, at rehab and, uh, you know, still learning to walk and function and uh, my back and my, you know, I, I, I broke uh, um, my lower back and, you know, my, my pelvis. And I always said my ass hurt all the time, you know, and, <laughs> So my wife's rubbing. So PD my, slapped it for you. <laughs> well, my, yeah, well, your PD slapped. Well, PD came in. She's rubbing my backside, and my you know my ass is exposed. And here comes the hockey team in, oh, in, no. in the door. You know, I don't know how many it was. There had to be a <laughs> dozen of them in the door. You know, and it's like they're raising hell. And uh, the nurse comes in, and you know she's getting ready to throw everybody at them. Like, what? It's the hockey team. Relax. You know, it's like. <laughs> but we had a you know I listened to team. The team was great to me, you know, like uh, through the whole thing, you know, um, I got to drop the uh, the day I left Helen Hayes was the, you know, the day of um, the game at the Coliseum in 2005, you know, Okay. and uh, they picked me up from Helen Hayes. I'm getting discharged and it's right to the Coliseum, not my barn of choice, but that's where we're yeah. going, you know, well, whatever, to, you know, <laughs> Bye, so, uh, so we, uh, you know, we, we, we head out to the Coliseum and, uh, um, you know, I'm going to drop the ceremonial puck. Um, and, uh, I remember, uh, Carrie Frazier and Kevin Collins came up to me, you know, cause that was the lockout too. So, you know, uh, right. for the NHL and, uh, they introduced themselves to me and I knew both of them, you know, cause I'm an avid, you know, hockey fan and, uh, you can't miss Carrie with his, with that nice hair, you know? Yeah, and, right. uh, and uh, I go, I know who you guys both are. I go, right game, wrong building, you know. <laughs> and they both got a giggle out of it, you know. But it was, uh, it was good stuff, you know. Um, That's us. Awesome. I remember that. I I, I played that year. Um, oh. I think we won. You did win, correctly. of course you did. Yeah, All I think right. it was my my pep talk. I got to come in a locker room, and you know, no, right. it was it was great. I still uh, I still have the jersey uh, that you guys gave me uh, signed by the whole team. It's hanging in my office. Uh, Awesome. Down in my uh, down in Myrtle Beach, in my house there, you know. So that's awesome. Um, well, good stuff. Well, hopefully, we'll see uh, we'll see your son skating out there next year. Hopefully, I I hope so. I really do. You know, he's he was just he was kind of days down the other day to me. Uh, he's out on um, he's working in the uh, the fourteenth state with well, the one four station today in uh, in Lincoln Hospital. That's where he's working today. You know, he's doing his rotation. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So, but he's he's looking forward to being out there. Well, the team is uh they're still doing that types of stuff you know that's what that's what i love about them you know they're still you know there's no cameras around but they you know they go to hospitals they go to they, they visited ray when he was in hospice like stuff that people doesn't don't know about you know besides the, the giant checks they give the widows and children when nobody's looking you know they do a lot of cool stuff like that so for me you know scoring the goals and and playing hockey was fun but yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's the stuff I'm I'm proud of is that this you know it's been 50 years and they're still doing it. The young kids still care, you know. A lot of change has changed on the job, but we still have that, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So that's that's cool. good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right, here's here's another quick hockey story is that uh, you know, um, after 9/11, the first home game at at the at the Garden, um, you know, the FD and PD is on the ice and uh, 
and Larry McGee's out there and he's got uh, his helmet on with uh, with uh, Chief Downey's uh, prayer card on it. You know, right. and he goes over to Messier and you know the whole story, yeah. you know, the PD story. I don't know if we can tell the PD story. <laughs> <but> anyway. <laughs> I'll, I'll let PD tell the PD story. We'll get him on. I can't do it justice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, um, that, um, you know, the picture was taken and I'm friends with Larry, you know, and, uh, you know, Messier was my favorite all time player. And uh, I met Messier um, down the road through Pat LaFontaine. Um, uh, I met uh, Patty, great guy, you know, talked a lot of hockey, took me to a couple games and uh, he has me meet Messier and uh, and I meet Mark Messier's uh, sister, Mary Kay. And uh, she's like, she wants some rescue three stuff. And I'm like, well, just give me an address and I'll send you some stuff. She goes, whatever you want sign, you know? So I get the picture with, um, with Larry's helmet on, on, you know, with, um, uh, with, with Mark wearing it, you know, right. and I have it, uh, personalized to me, you know, I mean, that's just, uh, that's awesome. that means, you know, it means more than one thing, you know, having that picture, you know, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool to have, you know, but that was, uh, that was some night, you know, uh, actually I talked to Mike Richter and, he recanted that night, you know, to me, you know, how, mm -hmm. how great it was, you know, um, no, that was, it would be great to have that feeling that we have in our country again, you know, today, you know, after, uh, after nine 11, you know, right. that, how proud everybody felt the flag waving and everything, you know, but no. Right. And just the genuine, uh, caring about each other. Absolutely. You know, it just, yeah. th that's, that's the part of the feeling that, yeah. that we miss, I think is, is, I don't know. People care we can, too much. We can, we can okay. agree to disagree, right? right? Agree to disagree, but still take care of your fellow human, human, uh, mankind, mankind. You know, it's like human being, mankind. You know, just well, you said you know. it yourself with your therapist, right? You guys uh, sounded to me like you were saying on opposite sides of the political spectrum, but absolutely, but you're both humans, right? But there's more to that connects you to than than you know what color you vote for. I think people get you know they dig their heels in over stuff that really ultimately shouldn't matter. You know, if, yep. if we just actually even agree to disagree, that's something that's better than just constantly yelling at each other, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so why sure. we don't usually talk about politics on this show. Cause uh, well, <laughs> I, kept it, I kept it very, <laughs> there's uh, enough, there's uh, enough of it yeah. out there. Yeah. 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 So, yeah I I say, you know, so let's go back to Joey's foundation real quick. Sure. You know, so Joey's, Joey's Foundation, it seems to be growing and growing. I mean, this is the biggest seminar that we did this year. Um, that's our biggest fundraiser um, that, you know, I mean, we're training firefighters. Like um, we're, so that seminar that we run, it mirrors FDIC and I'm not taking away from FDIC. We have the same quality of instructors that are there. Actually, many of the instructors that are at FDIC are at our seminar, right. but it's a more intimate atmosphere. Uh, where actually students can actually, you know, touch um, and talk to the instructors. And all that money that's being raised that day is going right back out there to make firefighters safer. Right. Um, just recently, uh, we started uh, talking about having a seminar in Texas. And it looks like in April of uh, 2022, um, we're going to be in the Houston area uh, running our first seminar there. And, you know, we look to continue to make or grow and to make firefighters safer. And, you know, guys can go to, uh, to the joeydfoundation.org and, uh, you know, check us out, you know, donate to us, uh, buy swag from us, buy a t-shirt, buy a coin, you know, um, look and see when the, you know, seminar is coming up again, cause we run a yearly one out in uh, Long Island and Suffolk County. And, you know, this is going to be the first one in Texas. Um, who knows, maybe we'll have one on the West coast, you know, um, Hawaii. I was say, well, if you, to come if, to you, Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, if 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 you're listening and you think your departments and the surrounding departments would benefit, get in touch with the foundation and uh, if we could set something up. But at the very least, you can make a donation, um, sign up for one of the seminars. Uh, it's definitely a great cause, um, and I think uh, I think I'm going to have to let you go because I don't want to keep you all day, and I could. Um, but we're going to put up the link for your foundation. Everybody, please read up, uh, read up on black Sunday. I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but we also had another fatality that day. So if you're listening, um, it was a very dark day in the history of the FDNY. Uh, we lost three members on that day and we lost Joey D, 
uh, six years later, right? Seven years later. Yeah, um, six years later. But yeah, man, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you staying positive um, and setting the good example for for the others out there who who went through a lot of this type of stuff. Um, we need to see people like you uh, doing what you do. It, it, believe it or not, it helps. So I well, thank, thank you, you on their behalf um, and my behalf. But uh, thanks for coming on, man. And I just I just want to add something. Yeah, you know, go ahead. You, you said we lost another guy that day. Yeah, his. His name was because it, it's so important. You know, Black Sunday became yeah. Black Sunday because it was it was the the darkest day in the New York City Fire Department post nine eleven. Okay, um, mm -hmm. and uh, Black Sunday was uh, a name that was dubbed by the media. You know, and right. uh, some people get it wrong. They're like Black Friday. No, it's not Black Friday. It's yeah. Black Sunday. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, um, that morning, you know, uh, uh, it was a catastrophic fire. Um, you know. John Blue and Kurt Meyer were killed that 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 morning, and uh, I think uh, to guys listening to the radio uh, that day, you know, uh, listening to Citywide, and I, I know there was a guy sitting in Brooklyn listening to it, and uh, his name was Richie Scafani. I know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Richie. Um, he was in 103 truck, and uh, he was in the Special Operations Command for a short time. He was a Squad 18 firefighter, and uh, he went back to 103 truck and unfortunately he lost his life that afternoon. And, you know, sometimes in a job, you know, um, you know, we, we really don't think it's going to be us, you know, it's yeah. not going to be us, but unfortunately, you know, guys died to the left and right of us in this job. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we lost, uh, we lost Richie that day also. And, and I just want to 17 years, it's coming up the 23rd of January, and, you know, I, 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 I continue to tell the story of Black Sunday. I go out and talk and, uh, you know, Richie's always included, you know, and, and, and that, you know, and I play a video with the brothers that, that worked with him in 103, you know, recanting who Richie was. Absolutely. Last episode, I told the story about his puppy um, that was waiting for him back at the firehouse that day. Apparently he had a little Boston Terrier he was chained up to his gear locker when they went out on the run. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a tough day. I was one of those people listening on the radio in Brooklyn to both of those fires. Um, definitely the, the toughest day I've had to work and not do anything, you know, it was a tough one, but, uh, but yeah, we definitely remember Richie. Um, you know, he worked in my company for a little while. I've heard some other funny stories about him, uh, which I'll save for another episode, but <laughs> some very high-ranking chiefs have been put in chokeholds. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, we'll get to that one. I'll bring on an old timer from Squad 18 to tell that story. There you go. But uh, thanks to Jeff. Um, I'll just leave you with this. Let's go Rangers. Uh, I really want to see a Stanley Cup in New York City again uh, before this is all over. So it looks like Me we're getting too. there. It might be a, a piece or two to the puzzle that's missing, you know. I mean, '94 seems like forever ago, you know. I know then, it was too know, too like, long ago. I need another one. I need I my my boys need one, you know. They're they're 24 and 21. They, they uh, like when are we going to see a cup? You know. Yeah. I'm actually going to go. I'm going to go to uh, the game Friday night. That'll be my first uh, game at the Garden this year. Uh, I, I haven't been down. You know, I I don't have my season tickets anymore. But uh, all you know, right, well uh, I'll hit you up. I. I I have a few tickets. I went in with a bunch of guys, but I don't have every game, but uh, I'll hit you up. Yeah. All right. Appreciate we'll that. Down. All okay, right, Jeff. Good, brother. Thank you for everything. Thanks for your positivity and uh, be well. And I'll pay, be on the lookout. My brother's coming after you for that helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I'd sneak it. it in. I told him I'd sneak it in the interview. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. Be well.